for all the Buddha's teachings on not-self. He has some good uses for the concept of self. The beginning of wisdom, he says, starts with a question. What, when I do it, will lead to my long-term harm and suffering? And what, when I do it, will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? The I and the my there. show two sides of the concept of self. One is the self as the producer. What, when I do it, will lead to happiness. In other words, your sense of control over some parts of your experience. You can control your body to some extent. You can control your mind to some extent. The question is, how are you going to use that control to lead to happiness? How are you going to use it to avoid long-term suffering? This measure of control is something you have to take seriously. So when the Buddha talks about self, he says the only really useful concept for self, or the only really useful way of defining a sense of self, is where you have control, where you have power to have things go along with what you want. And although there are a lot of things in life that you can't bring in line with what you want. Still, there are some things you can, and it's good to be very clear about where the line is between those two things, because oftentimes we confuse it. We try to control things that we really can't, and we neglect to control some things where we really do have some power, particularly in the area of the mind. If it weren't possible to bring the mind under some control, you couldn't do meditation. You couldn't focus the mind, you couldn't be mindful, you couldn't develop any of the qualities that are needed. You'd just be sitting there waiting for something to happen. But as the Buddha said, if skillful qualities couldn't be developed, he wouldn't teach people to do it. Unskillful qualities couldn't be abandoned, he wouldn't teach people to do it. But we can do these things. So we do have some measure of control. And that's where we should focus it. What mental qualities am I allowing to take over my mind? How am I complicit with false friends in the mind? That chant we had on friends just now doesn't refer just to outside friends. There are false friends in your mind. And we don't like to think about it, but we're often complicit with the very things that are going to destroy our concentration. The Buddha has all kinds of techniques for dealing with sensual desire, ill will, sloth and torpor, restlessness and anxiety, uncertainty, all of the hindrances. And they're perfectly good tools. But if you're siding with your defilements, if you're siding with your hindrances, the tools are for naught. Might as well not have them. So you have to learn how to remind yourself, this is what you really want to do. You really want to get past these hindrances, and you really want to develop skillful qualities. And this is where the beginning of right effort starts with generating desire. You want to motivate yourself, remind yourself of why you want to do these things, why you want to be skillful, why you don't want to be unskillful. Because this is where the other side of self comes in, the self that's experiencing the happiness and the suffering that come from the things you do. You have to keep reminding yourself, yes, you will suffer if you're not skillful. And if you do develop skillfulness, if you put the effort in right now, it's going to bring results right now and on into the future. So that what when I do will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness. That's the self on the receiving side, the experiencing side. So you've got the self as the producer and the self as the receiver. And you want to take them seriously. 
if you apply the teaching on not-self indiscriminately, you say, well, there's nobody doing anything, there's nobody experiencing anything, it's just empty phenomena rolling on, who cares about what they roll into? That's an unskillful application of the teaching. The Buddha makes this clear in one of his discourses where a monk has been asked, what is the result of karma? And he says, stress. The justification being, well, all feelings are stressful, therefore karma leads to feelings, so karma leads to stress. That, he said, was not the time to apply that teaching. The relevant teaching was the fact that there are three kinds of feeling. There are pleasant feelings, there are painful feelings, and feelings that are neither pleasant nor painful. And those are the ways of thinking about feeling that are useful when you're thinking about what you're doing, what you want to get out of your actions. Because if you think that everything you feel is going to be stressful, then who cares what you do, because it's all going to be stress. There's no, no motivation to be skillful at all. But you keep running into the fact that your actions do lead to a range of feelings that are, go from pleasant, can be very pleasant all the way to very painful. And do you want to experience those painful feelings? Do you really want to, if you want to experience the pleasant ones, you've got to do what's needed. So this is where I thought of the self as having some control is useful and in motivating you to make good use of that control. There are two other areas where the Buddha specifically talks about the usefulness of self. Well, actually, one of them is when the Buddha talks about another Ananda. The first one, the Buddha talks about the self as what he calls as a governing principle. Where you're supposed to remind yourself, now that I've embarked on the path of the practice, it wouldn't be fitting for me to fall back into old ways of indulgence. Because after all, I do want to put an end to suffering. I don't want to continue suffering on and on and on, the way I have been. And so as he says, making your sense of self your governing principle, in other words, making it your main motivation, seeing yourself as the experiencer or the, on the receiving end of the pleasure or pain that come from your actions. You can use that as a motivation to stick with the path. As for the self as the producer, that's in Venerable Ananda's discussion with a nun. It's an interesting story. She's attracted to Ananda, and she wants to get him attracted to her. So she lets it out that she's sick. She wants him to come and teach her the Dharma. There are two versions of the story. One is where this is in the Sarvastivadin version, where she lies in the bed, and as soon as she, he comes into the room, she throws off the covers and she's totally naked. The Theravadan version, which I think is probably more true to what can happen in a situation like that, she sees him coming, so she lies down on the bed, covers her head with a robe, pretends to be sick, hoping that he would come and teach her to the Dharma, and then she would gradually show her face and say, thank you so much for teaching the Dharma, that was very sweet of you. And then things can go from there. Then he teaches her that the body depends on food, and it's by using food that we come to the point where you don't need food anymore. It comes into being through conceit, and it's through by using conceit that you don't need conceit anymore comes into being through craving, and it's by using craving that you don't need craving anymore. And as for sex, he says, the Buddha t tells you to cut off the bridge on that one. You don't use it at all. It's the teaching on conceit that's relevant to the issue about self. He says, you think of the fact that other people have attained the end of suffering. They're people. You're a person. They can do it. Why can't you put an end to suffering? So here, think about yourself as the producer, someone who is capable, someone who is competent. 
these other human beings, and you can think about all of them, the monks and the nuns and the lay people and the adults, the old people and the children, who in the past had to put up with a lot of difficulties, but were ultimately able to reach awakening. And people aren't born arahants. They start out with people. They start out. <coughs> they start out as people with defilements, just like yours. Sometimes worse than yours. That they were able to straighten themselves out. They can do it. Why can't you? The sin of conceit here is not that you're better than other people, but at least that you're equal to other people. That too can count as a kind of conceit, and that too can be useful. That sense of self as the competent producer. You can develop skillful qualities. You can act in skillful ways, speak in skillful ways, think in skillful ways. You can develop these habits. That sense of self is useful. It keeps you encouraged on the path. In some places they say you need to Assume that you have Buddha nature so that you can do this, but the Buddha doesn't ask you to do that. He says, all you need to do is to be heedful, realizing that your actions are important, and they really do make a difference, and you have some control over them. So you want to train yourself as the producer so that the self as consumer or experiencer of pleasure and pain can reach a pleasure, can reach a happiness that's totally secure. Now, there are later stages once these senses of self have done their duty. You don't really need them anymore. You can put them aside. They're like tools. They do their work, and then you don't need to hang on to them anymore. But it's good to remember they do have their uses, and you don't want to throw the tools away before they've done their work. So if you can think of your sense of self, your perception of self as a tool, and understand exactly what kind of self you want to define, the self that's in control, and the self that really does prefer pleasure to pain, that's enough self to do the practice. So remember that the Buddhist teachings are a path. He doesn't start out with say, some first principles and argue logically all the way through the, the Dharma. He provides you with different techniques, different tools, different strategies that you will use at different stages along the path. And your duty is to make sure you know where you are, which strategies you need, and leave the more elementary strategies behind, and don't worry about the ones further down the path yet. They'll be there when you need them. The important thing is that you use the tools that are right for you right now. 